Chapter Five of The Thing from the Lake. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline. The Thing from the Lake by Eleanor M. Ingram. Chapter Five. The very room, cause she was in, seemed warm from floor to ceiling. The Corton. I arrived at noon when a bright sun set the country air afloat with notes like dust of gold. The place seemed drenched in golden light. Even the young grass had gold in its green, and the lake glittered hot with yellow sparkles. The house was transformed. The cream-colored stucco that hid its homely walls, deep arched porches that took the place of the old shallow affairs, scarlet Spanish tiles where bleached shingles had been, all united in giving it the gayest, most modern air imaginable. A gravel drive curved in beneath the new porte cochere, inviting the wheels of my car to explore. Grass had been put in order, flower beds laid out. The new dam was up, and the miniature lake no longer suggested a swamp. If the place had appealed to me in its dreary neglect, now it held out its arms to me and laughed an invitation. As I stepped from my car, I heard running feet and a girl sped around the veranda to meet me. She cast herself into my arms before I fairly realized this was Phillida. A Phillida as new to my eyes as the house. After the first greetings, I held her off to analyze the change. She was tanned and actually rosy. The corners of her once sad little mouth turned up instead of down, and developed, I looked twice, yes, developed a dimple. The dull hair I always had seen brushed plainly back now was parted on one side and fluffed itself across her forehead and about her cheeks with an astonishing effectiveness. She was attired in a china-blue linen frock with a scarlet sash knotted in front quite daringly for Phillida. "'Why, Phil, how pretty we are!' I admired. She looked up at me like a praised little girl and smoothed the sash. I noticed she wore above her wedding ring that diamond which once had adorned Vere's finger so distastefully to me. It shone bravely in the sunlight with quite a display of fire. Tracing my gaze, she held out her hand for me to see. Yes, it was his, Cousin Roger. Of course we have not very much money yet, and I do not care about all the engagement rings that ever were thought of. But I was afraid people up here might notice that I had none, and think slightingly of Ethan. So I asked him, and we went to a jeweler who made it smaller to fit me. It is not a false stone, you know. It is a white topaz, and I love it better than the biggest diamond. Then you are still happy? Forever and ever, world without end, she answered solemnly. We went in. Sun and sweet wind had worked white magic in the long closed house. Quaint furniture, no longer dust grimed but lustrous with cleanliness and polish, had quite a different air. Fresh upholstery in cheerful tints, fresh paper on the walls, good rugs, order and daintiness everywhere changed the interior out of my recognition. Already the atmosphere of home and cheer was established. "'Come see your rooms,' Phillida invited, enraptured by my admiration. "'They are so pretty.' She ran up the stairs, around the passage, and ushered me into the room of graceful adventure and grotesque nightmare. I stopped on the threshold. I had ordered the partition removed between the two chambers on this side, giving me one large room. This, with the little bathroom attached, occupied the entire large frontage of the house. This long, spacious room, 
floors covered by my Chinese rugs, walls echoing the rugs smoke blue, my piano in a bright corner, my special easy chairs and writing table in their due places, welcomed me with such familiar comfort that I could not identify the neglected chamber where I had slept one night in the old bed with the four pineapple-topped posts. The windows were opened, and white curtains with their overdraperies of blue silk were swinging in and out on a fresh breeze where the horror of my dream had seemed to press itself against the black panes. Decidedly, I must have had a bad attack of indigestion that night. "'See how nice?' Phillida was urging appreciation at my side. "'We swung those lovely old hangings from the arch, so they can be drawn across the bedroom end of your room, if you like. Although I do not know why you should like. Everything is so pretty. Your long Venetian mirror came safely, and all your darling lamps. And, and I hope you like it so well, Cousin Roger, that you will stay here always. When she left me alone, I walked to the different windows, contemplating the stretches of lawn dotted with budding apple trees, and the lake that lay beyond, shining in the sun. Was Phillida's charming wish to become a fact, I wondered? Could this rest and calm hold me content here? where I had meant merely to pause and pass on. I looked at the yellow country road meandering past the lake into unseen distance. Should I ever see my lady of the beautiful tresses come that way, or travel that road to where she lived? If I did meet her, would she forgive me the loss of her braid? There would be a test for the sweetness of her disposition. When a chiming dinner gong summoned me downstairs, I found Vere awaiting me beside Phillida. We shook hands, and he made some brief, pleasant speech about their having expected me sooner. If pale, timid Phil had become a surprising butterfly, Vere had taken the reverse progress toward the sober grub. I like him better in outing clothes although he showed even more the unusual good looks which so unreasonably prejudiced me against him. If he felt any strain in our meeting, his slow, tranquil trick of speech and manner covered it. I hope I did as well. It was then I discovered that his wife's pet name for him fitted like a glove. She called him Drawls. The luncheon was good, cooked and served by a middle-aged Swedish woman named Christina. Afterward, I was conducted into the kitchen by the lady of the house to view the new fittings and improvements. Most odd and pretty it was to see Phillida in that role of housewife, and to watch her pride in veer and deference to him. Let me record that I never saw the daughter of Aunt Caroline fail in this settled course toward her husband. Whether it was born of revulsion from her mother's hectoring domestic methods, or of consciousness that outsiders might rate Vere below his wife in station and education, so her respect for him must forbid their slight, I do not know. But I never saw her oppose him or speak rudely to him before other people. I suppose they may have had the usual conjugal differings, neither of them being angelic. If so, no outsider ever glimpsed the fact. We spoke of nothing serious on that first day. They both showed me the various improvements finished or progressing, indoors or out. We dined as agreeably as we had lunched. Quite early, afterward, I excused myself and left together the two who were still on their honeymoon. At the door of my room, I pushed a wall switch that lighted simultaneously three lamps. In this I had repeated the arrangement used by me for years in my city apartment. I have a demand for light somewhere in my makeup, and no reason for not indulging it. There flashed out of the dusk a large lamp upon my writing table, a tall floor lamp beside the piano, 
and a reading lamp on a stand beside my bed at the far end of the room. All three were shaded in a smoke-blue and rose-color effect that long since had caught my fancy for night work, the shades inset with imitation semi-precious stones, rough-cut things of sapphire, tourmaline pink, and baroque pearl. I lay emphasis upon this to make clear how normal, serene, and even familiar in effect was the room into which I came. Yet, as I closed the door behind me and stood in that softly brilliant radiance, a shudder shook me from head to foot with the violence of an electric shock. A sense of suffocation caught at my throat like an unseen hand. Both sensations were gone in the time of a drawn breath, leaving only astonishment in their wake. Presently I went on with the purpose that had brought me upstairs, lifting a portfolio to the table and beginning to unpack the work which I had been doing in New York. As I laid out the first sheets of music, there drifted to my ears that vague sound from the lake I had heard on my first night visit here, while I stood on the tumble-down porch. The sound that was like the smack of glutinous lips, or some creature drawing itself out of thick, viscid slime. As before, I wondered what movement of the shallow waters could produce that result. Not the tide, now, for the new dam was up and the lake cut off from Long Island Sound. The pouring of the waterfall flowed on as a reminder of that fact. The sound was not repeated. The dusk outside the windows offered nothing unusual to be seen. I finished my unpacking and sat down at my writing table. I am not accustomed to heed time. There never has been anyone to care what hours I kept, and I worked best at night. Midnight was long past when I thought of rest. I declare that I thought of nothing more, not even recalling the vague unease felt on entering the room. A day spent in the fresh air, followed by an evening of hard work and journeyings between the piano and table, had left me utterly weary. When I lay down, it was to sleep at once. End of chapter 5 Recording by Roger Moline